This is KGW News at 5. And now at 5 o'clock, we begin with new information about the fatal Amtrak derailment in Montana. The train was heading to Portland and Seattle. Federal investigators say the Amtrak train was not speeding when it went off the tracks. The derailment killed three people and injured dozens more. Devin Haskins spoke with a Portland passenger who survived the train crash with only a minor cut. Aubrey Green, who's 88 years old, had just spent some time in a town that he grew up in as a child. He was on his way back home here to Portland when the Amtrak train he was on derailed, sending the car he was in onto its side. This is where they'll, you walk between the two cars. This is the front end, that's the tail end. I sat with Aubrey Green in his car outside his Portland home. Yeah, this is where I came out. He showed me on his tablet photos he took after walking away from this train derailment on Saturday. All along between here, it's about 150 yards from where this stopped and it broke loose and ours stopped. He says just before it went off, he heard a loud sound, then another. He says a second one sounded like two cars separating. And then boom, I mean, uh, everything just, things were hitting and I hit my shoulder and there was three women that came one after the other right over the top of me, almost together. Green says he saw people injured but didn't know how bad and did say there was at least one that wasn't moving. Officials say that three people are dead, at least five are in the hospital with serious injuries, and dozens more were injured. NTSB Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg. You know, maintenance is going to be a very big concern for us. We don't know at this point uh, exactly what happened, whether it was a track issue, whether it was um, a mechanical issue with the train. So all of these things are open. Investigators say about 80 minutes before, a different train had passed through the same area. They have camera footage from both trains and say the Amtrak train was going between 75 to 78 miles an hour when it derailed. The speed limit on that stretch is 79 miles an hour. Two days after the crash, Green says he sees something else when looking at these photos. So, to me, I'm just looking at an accident. I'm not thinking about, yeah, right about here inside is where I was. And while most people would say they will never ride in a train again after experiencing something like that, not green, to get back here to Portland, he took the next train home. In downtown Portland, I'm Devin Haskins, KGW News. Thanks to Devin, we are coming off another violent weekend in Portland. Police responded to 16 shootings. One man is dead, 10 other people are hurt. One shooting happened during the day yesterday on Northeast Fremont and MLK. Police didn't tell us much about it except to say that someone under 18 got hurt. That victim was taken to the hospital. A family that runs a nearby restaurant says it's time for the city and its leaders to act. It's really unsafe. Come up with a plan or something, you know, to make the community better, make the people feel more safe. This shooting adds to the more than 900 Portland has seen this year. For context, there were fewer than 400 in 2019. On Sunday morning, three people outside a Northeast Broadway Street bar got shot and were taken to the hospital. On Friday, someone shot into a pizza place on Northwest 21st in Gleason, hurting two people and killing 34-year-old Jacob Knight Vasquez. Police have not found any of the shooters. In Clackamas County, investigators are looking into a deadly shooting they say happened during a traffic stop. The Clackamas County Sheriff's Office says around 2 this morning, a deputy tried to arrest a person near Southeast 145th and King Road in Happy Valley. There was a struggle, and the Sheriff's Office says the deputy shot the person who died at the scene. Deputies say a handgun was found nearby. The Clackamas County Major Crimes Team and the District Attorney's Office are investigating. Now that Pfizer's COVID vaccine booster has been approved for certain groups, already people are getting their shot. People who are eligible include those 65 and older, younger folks with underlying conditions, and people who are at high risk of COVID exposure through their jobs. Think positions like healthcare workers and teachers. We sat down with 81 year old Nancy Duggan, who got her booster on Saturday. She says she was right on top of making an appointment at her local Walgreens in Northeast Portland. The day of the announcement, I called them and they said, well, we're not going to be ready till tomorrow. But if you go on our website, you can sign up, you know, kind of thing. So that's how I did it. I have tickets to Van Gogh, so I feel comfortable that I can go to Van Gogh. 
where I would say before I got this booster, even though I'd gotten the tickets, I wasn't sure. The booster shot should be given at least six months after the first two doses. The vaccine conversation right now also surrounds young children and when they might be able to get the shots. One question deals with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and whether that will be available for that age group. Ariane Daytil has our verified tonight. With kids back in the classroom, we're getting a lot of questions about the status of COVID-19 vaccines for children. A Verify viewer asked us on Facebook about the status of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for teens. So let's verify. Is Johnson & Johnson still planning to make its vaccine available for teens and young children? Our sources are Johnson & Johnson, an associate professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and the FDA. Pfizer was the first vaccine to get emergency use authorization for adults in December, followed closely by Moderna, then J&J &J in February. Professor Maureen Farron says that put J&J &J at a disadvantage. I think that three months really put the Johnson & Johnson on a much slower track compared to the mRNA vaccines. Um, and then they also had numerous rollout issues right after um, they got approval. First, the FDA paused the distribution of the vaccine for 10 days following reports of a rare blood clot. Then there were months long manufacturing issues at its Baltimore supplier, leading to even less availability. Today, more than 100 million Americans are fully vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, 68 million with the Moderna and less than 15 million with the J&J. &J. Farron says the combined issues have caused further delays in expanding the J&J &J vaccine to teens and children. The best I can see is they're looking out into 2022 now. A J&J &J spokesperson told Verify it is planning four phase three studies in children and said there is still an unmet need to vaccinate kids, but did not provide a timeline. So it's true that Johnson & Johnson is still planning to make its vaccine available for teens and young children if it's proven safe and effective. The first group will likely be children ages 12 to 17, followed by rolling it out to even younger children, similar to Pfizer. With your Verify, I'm Ariane Till. A Washington state trooper who died from COVID is honored a day after his death. Trooper Eric Gunderson died at a Portland hospital over the weekend. Today, first responders escorted his remains from Oregon to a funeral home in Lakewood, Washington. He led the state patrol's drone fleet and would travel the country teaching law enforcement about the advantages of using drones. It's thought that he caught COVID on one of those trips. And because of that, this is considered a death in the line of duty. He's a good man who lost his life serving a state. Let's lay this good man to rest and let's, let's honor his family by honoring their request for not politicizing his loss, but simply remembering his service and grieving his loss. Trooper Gunderson's family is choosing to keep his vaccination status private. He was 38 years old. The fight over new congressional and legislative boundaries in Oregon is over. Lawmakers approved the changes today. They had until midnight to vote or it would go to the secretary of state and judges to make the decision. House Democrats unveiled a new congressional map on Saturday. Oregon will have a new sixth district after the latest census numbers. Lawmakers also approved the boundaries for the state legislative districts. The vote was almost entirely along party lines. The exception was two Democrats who voted no with Republicans. Governor Brown has until midnight to sign the bills into law. Oregon Treasurer Tobias Reed has announced he's running for governor. The Democrat has been treasurer since 2017. He said his campaign will focus on getting Oregonians vaccinated, as well as investing in education and job training and clean energy. Reed was also a state representative for 10 years before becoming treasurer. He represented District 26, which covers the Beaverton area. You can see a full list of candidates who have announced that they're running for governor at KGW.com. A new gun law went into effect over the weekend, and Oregon lawmakers hope it'll help slow down gun violence. Oregon State Senator James Manning Jr. is one of the chief sponsors. It allows places like the state capitol, airports, schools, and universities to ban firearms inside their buildings. And in an effort to cut down the number of unintentional shootings, the bill also calls for guns to be securely stored and locked when they're not being used. It's about accountability and hopefully we will get to a place where we don't have all of this gun violence and innocent people being killed. Uh, we got a lot of work to do and uh, we got a long ways to go. 
If someone brings a gun into one of the places we just mentioned that can now ban guns, they can now face up to a year in prison. And if you own a gun and it's not locked and secured and gets into the wrong hands, you can face a fine anywhere between $500 and $2,000. A Portland family is desperate to find their loved one who's been missing for close to a week. They're looking for Isela Morales. She was last seen Monday near Northeast 128th and has solo. Morales is five foot five and was last seen wearing a green shirt, jeans, and a black jacket. She was on foot with no phone and no money. Yesterday, about 100 people looked for her, passing out flyers, hoping to bring her home. They've heard rumors that she may still be in the area, but that she needs help. You know, so I know her family is missing her. She's a lovely personality, you know, she likes to joke and laugh and you know, wants to see everybody happy, so that's always, you know, uh, nice to nice to see and uh, you know we miss that if you know where Morales is or you see her call 911 Portland police arrested more than a dozen people in North Portland yesterday as part of a new crackdown on street racing. A new city ordinance passed last month allows officers to find street racers, tow their cars, and carries a punishment of up to 30 days in jail. Police say last night's speed racing mission came with the help of the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office and Oregon State Patrol. Portland police say at least five people have died as a result of street racing since June of last year.